Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Therapist Theater. It's the podcast that takes a look at relationships and mental health through the lens of movies, TV, and pop culture. I'm your host, Josh Treese. I've got a master's degree in marriage and family counseling and therapy, and I'm a practicing therapist in Music City, USA. I'm on a mission to help people more easily understand mental health and relationships and help break down the stigmas surrounding counseling and therapy. And that's why every week a guest therapist and I talk about a movie and what relationship or mental health issues it highlights. Thanks so much for downloading today's show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And while you're doing that, help other people find the show by giving it a five-star rating and writing a review for it in the podcast app. Today in the theater, my guest is Jesse Whitfield. Jesse is a counselor in Nashville who works with clients on better understanding their mood disorders, overcoming their trauma history, and better managing relationship changes or difficulties in their lives. She brought with her 1987's The Princess Bride. You know what? I'm tempted to say that if I need to tell you what this movie is about, then you missed out on part of your childhood. (laughs) I'm tempted to say that, except that Leanne hadn't seen this movie until just a few years ago. So, just in case you've missed out on it too, IMDb says it's a fairy tale story within a story with an all star cast. Yeah, that's a real plot summary on IMDb. So, let's try another. While homesick in bed, a young boy's grandfather reads him the story of a farm boy turned pirate who encounters numerous obstacles, enemies, and allies in his quest to be reunited with his true love. There, that's better. We've only got a month left in this decade which is inconceivable. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. (laughs) Dim the lights, raise the curtain, and start the previews. Welcome to the theater. Jesse. Hey. Hi. Welcome to the theater. Um, I like to start every conversation with why therapy? Why do you do what you do? So my story starts when I was in high school and my parents went through a nasty divorce and uh, my grandparents kind of stepped in to help my mom and us get settled and they decided that my brother and I needed therapy. And I hated it. And did you know anything about therapy? Oh no. Like, okay. Had you no. s- any clues from television or movies? So how did they pitch it to you? So l- let me rephrase. Not that I remember well. Um, I might have had an earlier group therapy experience. I think because I, thinking back, have some funky feelings around that might have happened. I don't really remember. Um, basically they pitched it to me as, Hey, we know that you guys are going through a really rough time. This is really hard. We want you to go and talk to somebody so that you can talk really freely and it doesn't feel like, you know, you're betraying anything. You can say whatever you need and it's not going to hurt our feelings and you can just talk to this person. And I think that the first person I saw was a male therapist and I had absolutely zero interest to in talking to a guy about anything personal. Was it with your, your brother? At the no, same time? Okay. we both went to, I don't remember if we went to the same person or two different therapists, but we both went and got our own yeah. stuff done. Um, and I remember, I remember sitting in this office in a giant like wing back chair as like a 13 year old and like, this is giant. This is uncomfortable. And just staring at this in my brain. I don't remember if he was or not rather large man mm. with very dark hair. He was just like, it's okay. I'll, I'll wait until you're ready to say something. And I think we sat there the entire session with yeah. me saying nothing, just like smoldering inside being super pissed off that I'm in this room with this dude that I don't know that I don't want to talk to. Mm-hmm. And, um, I went through, another therapist that I didn't connect with. And then we found a third therapist. Um, and you're like, how old? Like 14, maybe okay. 13, 14. So between like literally it was April, my eighth grade year, we were about to graduate. We were about to go to high school, you know, all that fun stuff. Um, my dad picked me up from school, which was a super weird thing in the first place. Kind of red flag of like, Hey, what's going on? Um, 
got home, my mom was very evidently ill, um, had been in the hospital, um, hadn't eaten, hadn't slept, hadn't had anything to drink for like a week, I think. Wow. Now, granted, this is my 13-year-old brain's recollection of the story. Yeah. Might be different. But um, so I got home and like things were not okay. And my dad just very calmly said, hey, you guys need to pack some things. You guys are going to go stay with your grandparents for a while. Um, and that's the last time I remember being back at that house. Um, like everything wow. just kind of radically shifted. That next year, um, I was supposed to go to the new high school in the area where I lived, brand new, like I was going to be one of the first graduating classes. I was really excited. Went into a completely different school. I'd been public school all my life. Suddenly, I'm in this new private school with like, I think we had a graduating class of 40 something. Mm -hmm. So just super huge, drastic changes. So like I get looking at that. Yes. Are you sure this isn't the plot of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? I mean, I wasn't in it. Did you move but... from Philadelphia to California? <laughs> as a no, 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 I promise. Okay. Um, but yeah, like lots of big changes, lots of reason for therapy to happen. But I didn't want it. I didn't connect until that third person. Um, oh. When I met with her, for some reason, something shifted. Second person, man or woman? Don't remember. Okay. But couldn't connect. Couldn't connect. So what do you remember what it was about the third person? Not at the beginning. Um, I worked with her for a pretty long time, off and on, all through high school. I saw her a few times in college even. Um, she was very, very relaxed, very relational, very like, hey, this is no big deal. Yeah. Like, just what's going on with you? Um, and for whatever reason, I connected with that. Hmm. And it was a very different feel than the first two. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Later on down the line, got into college, um, did a major in social work and creative writing towards the end of my time, realized there is way more like red tape and documentation. Social work mm -hmm. and creative writing. Mm -hmm. Did you have an idea that uh, you were <laughs> going to pair those two things together? Or? No, I just really, really loved creative writing. I'd written all my life and... Didn't think that that was a feasible financial something. So I'd like to enough to minor in it. Okay. But thought maybe I should choose something slightly more practical. So for a social major. work was a plan B? Kind of. Okay. Um, ironically, my last year, I realized I want nothing to do with social work. So I finished the degree and went out and got like an admin job doing just basic clerical stuff and i'm like no i'm not touching social work yeah. i don't want to do this um took about two three years off after college and realized okay i'm, I'm kind of done with this clerical admin work i don't like it it's not giving me anything other than a paycheck and there's got to be something else i can do Writing's still not feasible as a career choice for me. I don't want to be a starving artist. That doesn't work for me. What can I do? And so I was like, all right, well, what did I actually like when I was in college in terms of the classes and the coursework and the materials? And the one thing I remembered was this professor named Dr. Snyder who did a counseling course through the course of my social work coursework. And um, I loved it. It was the best thing about the program. I was like, maybe I could do counseling. I mean, you know, I had this good therapist. We worked well together. I really benefited from that. Maybe I could do counseling. And um, ended up going back to school and really, really loved it. Mm -hmm. um, when I did my practicum and internship, I was at the Refuge Center for Counseling in Franklin. And... Part of what I really liked about that was, though my degree was licensed professional counseling, so very, very individual-based, um, I was at a center in an agency that was very family and systems-based. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I got a really well-rounded approach to be able to work with whatever came through the door and do it well and mm -hmm. really connect with people pretty easily. Um, interestingly... One of the things with my program was, you know, well, yeah, you can stay at Refuge if they make sure and give you enough variety of clients. Um, apparently, 
it was pretty clear early on that I worked well with trauma. And so they kept giving me all of these like childhood traumatic, you know, abuse stories and sexual abuse patients. And here's all your domestic violence, you know, world. Real light stuff. Real. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, really? Really? This is not what I would have chosen. Are you sure about this? Hmm. Um, but it worked. And it was something that people were getting better and people were healing for their stories. And I was regularly freaked out thinking like, wait, can I actually do this? Am I actually like cut out for this? And I was very, very supported. And the answer kept being like, yes, you're good at this. You can do this. Don't worry so much. Just show up and be there. And it it grew into something that like after I graduated, that's just kind of the track that I took. I ended up working at a domestic violence center for about two years. Um, and I w- later went on to run a women's trauma informed care outpatient program at one of our local psych hospitals. And I loved it. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, looking into the present, mm-hmm. are you still working with those same things? A lot of it. Yes. Um, most of my current clients in private practice have some sort of history of trauma or sexual abuse, um, be it childhood or an adult life. Um, and interestingly enough, another trend I've noticed, a lot of them have either a bipolar or a borderline diagnosis. Um, Before they come in? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And, and so I don't know how that's kind of become a thing that I do, but it seems to be a thing that I do. Yeah. Um, which doing some of the trauma work at the hospital, that was something that I noticed wasn't an uncommon diagnosis to run hand in hand with a trauma background. Um, so it became something by nature of that work. I think I got more comfortable with it because, you know, I think we have some st- stereotypes around diagnoses that people don't want to touch. Um, I think especially those two. Yeah. Because they, those two have almost become like slang. Mm-hmm. Um, and not in a good way. I mean, Mm-mm. pretty dismissive. Yeah, very. Um, and so to actually, you know, have one of those diagnoses, I would imagine it's not something that somebody really prints on a t-shirt. You say that, but I've seen a lot of actually handmade t-shirts really? <laughs> along those lines from ah. my clients. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I've had a couple conversations with some of my um, borderline diagnosis clients when I was at the hospital, and I would affectionately call them like my pleasant borderlines. Like these are the people who have this diagnosis who have said, okay, yes, I see this diagnosis. Um, yes, I see this in myself. I don't like it. I want to change it. I don't want this to rule my roost and just, you know, run my life all haywire. What do I do about it? Hmm. Um, and I have learned that when you've got somebody with a trauma history and the way I see it, just these protective factors trying to help you through your life, help you through your story and keep you safe. When you recognize this isn't keeping me safe, this isn't working anymore, that's when you can start to see change happen. And that's where you can start to step in and actually affect different life choices and different outcomes. The, the pain of changing becomes less than the pain of staying the same. Correct. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I was thinking of, uh, I listened to, selectively listened to episodes of Dak Shepard's uh, armchair expert podcast mm. and he had on Nadine Burke Harris mm. who is the first and current surgeon general of California and she uh, wrote a book about childhood trauma the deepest well healing the long-term effects of childhood adversity she talks a lot about the aces adverse childhood mm-hmm. uh, experiences and has a seven uh, seven question assessment that she kind of asks people and talks about how it was born out of uh, some study in San Diego with people who were overweight and Mm. they were studying heart disease and they found out that they 
they were it, all these childhood uh, traumatic things were like surfacing mm. in that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, the long term effects of childhood trauma. How do you get past that? How do you process that? How do you? Um, and so you're saying you 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 see these things kind of surface mm-hmm. in personality disorders as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are there any other personality disorders that you work with? Or are you even targeting that? Or do you so just I, find... I don't target it. It's what tends to show up. It finds you? It, yeah, <laughs> it does. Do you think... How much... This is something second or third class mm-hmm. in my degree. They came in and started talking about specialties and picking an internship. And I was like, I don't even know where the bathroom is. And you're telling me to decide my whole life. Right. Holy cow. And at some point, somebody said, listen, don't worry. Your specialty will find you. Mm-hmm. You don't have to... Do you think that's it? Do you think that? <laughs> I don't know. That's a question that I've really been asking myself recently. Is it a chicken and egg thing? Maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Um, yeah. So I, I recently made this switch from being full-time at the hospital to being full-time in my private practice. And part of that shift was me investing in um, a business coach for myself And she was asking like, okay, so like, what do you work with? What do you do? How do you clarify this? And I'm like, I don't know, but like, here's this verbal vomit of everything that I see. And she's like, wait, okay. So you help millennials change their old thought patterns. I'm like, yeah, but that feels too basic and too broad. And she's like, but it's what you do. And I'm like, kind of, because when you look at it, when you're dealing with a bipolar diagnosis, when you're dealing with a borderline diagnosis, it's this something else is ruling the way that I think, the way that I function, whether it's this emotional reasoning of, I feel this, therefore it must be true, or everything is too overwhelming of a feeling, Mm -hmm. and I've got to operate out of this and protect all of my core self, um, it's rewiring that and bringing this awareness to, okay, what is it that your brain naturally does to help keep you safe? And is it actually serving you? And so to me, like working with that coach kind of helped give me that shift to say, okay, yes, this basic thing, I help people Mm -hmm. rewire their thought patterns to better manage emotions. But I think subset of that, if we're talking clinical language, I help people understand how do you live with a bipolar or a borderline diagnosis without that being something that's a total negative. Oh, my life is shot to shit now because I have Mm -hmm. this diagnosis. Of course I can never function. Of course I can never do anything productive in society. That doesn't mean anything. Yeah. I like that. So I, I don't ever want to presuppose that somebody that's listening speaks the same language as us. Mm -hmm. So is there a way to talk about what exactly a personality disorder is? So the way I have heard it best that I really like, and I've found most of my people respond well to somebody without a personality disorder, you walk around with a 180 view of life and you can see, like take a relationship with a significant other. You can see these are our arguments. These are our really great date nights. These are our really connected places. These are the places where their stuff, their past history, their past trauma, whatever, is impacting our relationship. And we see it all at once. We know that full story. Somebody with a personality disorder, and other clinicians may disagree with this, regardless of what kind of personality disorder it is, in my experience, you just have this snapshot little kind of pie piece view of anything at any given point. Because I work with a lot of borderline diagnosis, the way that I describe that best that people really resonate with, um, again, taking a romantic relationship, you have a really great date. This is the best person ever. Oh my God, I love this person. They are amazing. I can't believe I'm so lucky to be in their life and I found them and everything's gorgeous and rainbows and unicorns and oh my gosh, like this elevated high. Forgetting the fact that about a week ago, you had this knockdown, drag out, horrible screaming match over some something. And at that point in time, you thought they were the worst person ever. Yeah. You couldn't believe that you were in a relationship with them. And it's this very kind of black and white, either or, in that moment, whatever that most recent experience is, that's the truth. That does sound like blinders. Mm-hmm. 
Um, that was borderline. Mm-hmm. Have you? How much do you like superheroes? Ish. Okay. Have you ever watched Daredevil on Netflix? No. Season three of Daredevil is the best depiction of borderline I've ever seen. <gasps> That's um, exciting. You don't you you don't need to watch first two seasons. Okay. Um, it there's a um, enemy that he takes on that he starts taking on, and at the beginning you get introduced to this enemy as like a military guy, mm-hmm. and then they kind of start expounding on his backstory. He has borderline. He's got a diagnosis. You see therapy sessions of him and his therapist. Oh. His therapist records all of these tapes to give to him to listen, which is kind of DBT mm-hmm. um, instead of making a binder or mm-hmm. a notebook. Um, dialectical dialectical behavioral therapy. Yes. I have trouble pronunciating words. <laughs> I'm, that's a hard one even for it me. It really is. Um, and then you see as the season progresses – because of how he's isolating himself and how he stops following the self-care mm. plan that the therapist has laid out, how it begins to flare up yeah. and the effects of that. Yeah. And because it's a television season of like, I don't know, 10 or 13 episodes, like you get to slowly unpack that instead of just like a, in a movie showing somebody snap or something. Yeah. Um, and I thought I, I liked it because I think it gave a, even though it ended up being a super villain, but like it gave a rounded picture of a person and what they could be experiencing yeah, and how care, uh, managed care can help. Mm-hmm. And how, if, if, if you begin to neglect that, right. how you could potentially, um, I think, uh, I've read borderlines also biggest fear abandonment. Yeah. Um, one of my friends, I got to do like a hand motion. So like podcast listeners, but like, you know, he'll put one hand up as if saying stop and then mm-hmm. the other hand kind of slightly behind it saying come here. Yes. So it's this kind of guarded. Go away, come Self-protective closer. but wanting um, stop, go kind of kind of position. Uh, let's see. You also mentioned bipolar. Mm-hmm. We got two kinds, but like is there a way to sum up bipolar? Um, typically when I talk about it, regardless of the kind, um, I actually draw an illustration. So I draw a straight line and I say, okay, somebody who doesn't have any type of a mental health diagnosis, you're just an average human. You have emotions, you have thoughts, you do life. You're going to fluctuate up and down. And I draw this little wave, just kind of gentle, doesn't fluctuate and on and down the line it above goes. Above and below the above line. Above and below. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then I do two other lines first is for our bipolar one, um, which has your really high highs, that mania and your really low lows. And I will just do this really big alternating back and forth. And it's not a consistent alternating. So you have these variances of really high highs, really low lows, and then you kind of level out a little bit, or maybe you're high for the Mm -hmm. majority of time, or maybe you drop low for the majority of the time. And it's this kind of wonky discombobulated thing. Your bipolar twos, which are typically going to tend towards going low, um, not get those really high highs, but maybe some hypomania. You're going to be a little bit elevated from your average Joe or Jane, but then you're going to drop low a lot. And so, again, you've got this imbalance kind of flow and there's no predictability. There's no consistency. So a lot of times, regardless of whether... I'm working with somebody with a borderline diagnosis or a bipolar diagnosis. A lot of what we do is building self-awareness to figure out what do you feel and let's not attach that feeling to your life as though it's fact. Let's look at this as information instead. Mm -hmm. How do you take that and unpack what it's trying to tell you and say, okay, I see you, I feel you. I don't have to be afraid of you. And now this information that you're trying to give me what do I need to do with it? Do mm-hmm. I need to just look at that and say, okay, yes, it's here and I can move on with my life? Is it an indicator of, hey, maybe something's off in my job or in this relationship or in my finances? What is it that it's telling you? It doesn't have to be an all encompassing because I feel it. It must be true kind of thing like you're used to. Yeah. Um, and I would imagine part of that might be also helping them to recognize other signals that uh, a time of a high or a time of a low might be coming? How do you prepare? How do you manage? 
um, part of what you were saying kind of sounded like you were helping them kind of externalize it a bit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. See so it as something separate than them. One of my clients actually came in to me having already named her borderline. And we regularly talk about her borderline as though it's another person, um, as though she is taking over. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, well, damn it, you know, Jane, she's just taking over your life. I mean, man, do you see what she's doing here? She's like, yeah, I, you know, I don't love it. And it's like, okay, but why is she doing it? Well, she's kind of freaking out about this possibility of this relationship maybe falling apart. Oh, like IFS. A little bit. Okay. Not that I'm trained in IFS, but I, I like that concept. Sure. And it's, it is this part of when you're so used to your feelings being facts and being the thing that drive you, you've got to differentiate. You've got to pull that apart some way. And kind of that parts aspect has been a really helpful kind of formula mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Um, when I was running groups, I regularly talked about emotions as toddlers. So you go out on a playground and you watch toddlers hanging out. What do you notice? I don't know. They all, I mean, they all interact with each other pretty well. Yeah. I don't know about well, but I mean, pretty easily. Yeah. There's pretty easy ebb and flow. Uh, when you look at their play, you also notice some of it's really concrete, playing with the things on the playground, but there's also this element of imagination, right? Kids have super great imaginations. And so sometimes you'll see this kid who's you know, going along, having a great playtime, and something happens, and suddenly they're upset for seemingly no reason. And you see this little kid run to mom or dad and is like, oh my gosh, everything's horrible, I hate this. It's like, oh, honey, what happened? What's wrong? And you're thinking like, oh, my gosh, should somebody hit my kid? Did somebody bite my kid? Are they injured? No, no. The kid tells you, the pirate ship wrecked and it broke my cat. And I'm like, okay, there's no pirate ship. There's yeah. no cat. Like, none of this is real. But, oh, my gosh, this toddler is freaking out and having a very, very real in-depth connection to what happened. Same thing with your feelings. Your feelings are so, so real and so, so fully embodied, but you've got to look at that information they're telling you. Yeah. Are and they I also think it, 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 it's a reminder to me of that feelings aren't right or wrong. Yes. Feelings are. Exactly. The, but there's always a story that we're telling ourselves that's attached to that. So while the feeling may be correct, what story are you telling yourself exactly. that is producing this feeling? Yes. Because there, there's tons of ways that I can misunderstand something mm -hmm. that my wife told me and feel all kinds of hurt and sad uh, and angry and, and, and fearful about it. But maybe she didn't actually say what I thought she said. Right. Maybe she, she said it, but I put a filter over it based right. on my past and my life. You know, And so my feeling is a thing. It's giving mm -hmm. me information. But the story that I'm telling myself about it isn't correct. Correct. And it's, it's being able to recognize that, Hey, I feel this thing and I've got to evaluate a little bit further. Yeah. And it's getting into that practice that can help to help you ground, to help you kind of gain some clarity, to help you do relationships better, to help you just do your life better. So I'm hearing you say that with your clients, mm -hmm. you help them, I'm going to use the word filter still identify what filters, what lenses that they look at life through. Yep. Evaluate. Are these working for me? Yep. And then potentially if they decide that they're not, how do I get some new lenses or at least how do I, if I can't get new ones, how do I understand the ones I have better? Yes. To where I am controlling them and they're not controlling me. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah. So let's talk about a movie. Yay. What movie did you bring to talk about today? So I decided to choose The Princess Bride. It's perfect. Um, Leanne had never seen this before a year or two ago. What? And has since seen it once. <laughs> That's just unfathomable yeah. in my brain. <laughs> I, 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 I know. And, and she has seen so many like child i mean you know every childhood movie you could think about <laughs> some that i haven't even seen i mean i'll admit you know i haven't seen like never ending story and <gasps> no. things like that but princess bride i feel like is like entry level yes kid yes 
It should be baseline for so many people in the world. Yes. Everybody should see this. Yeah, it's a classic. And I feel like people could even be quoting it without having seen it. It's so ingrained in the, um, just in the zeitgeist. Yes. Um, so why did you pick this movie? So honestly, <laughs> as much thought as I put into, okay, Jess, what movie do you want to bring? I couldn't think of anything better. That's good. It's kind of my default answer when people yeah. ask me like, hey, what's your favorite movie? Oh, Princess Bride. Like, no brainer. And so I was like, okay, if I'm having to think this hard about a movie to choose for this podcast, why am I not just using my favorite? Yeah. There you go. Favorite movie, I think, has always been a tough question for me. Mm. Because there's so many. Like, just this year, I mean, with just episodes alone, this is the 47th movie I've watched. So then, I mean, of course, I've watched movies outside of this. So, like, I've seen a lot of movies this year. So then to say, like, all right, pick one. Pick one. That's your, like, <laughs> favorite. It, it, then your brain wants to, like, split everything into categories and go, oh, wait. Like, are you talking about a comedy or a, yep. this kind of thing? And so there, I always – actually, uh, the podcast changed this. I had always tucked away Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. That was the one that I always went to and said that's my favorite just because – I was obsessed with the visuals and I thought the story was incredible and all that. And it's just easy to just throw one out so you don't have to hem and haw with somebody. Right. But then now getting clinically trained and like digging into it more, I'm like, that movie makes me so sad now <laughs> that like I don't, Yeah. I still love it, but I don't want to say it's my favorite, but yeah, it's t saying a favorite movie. That's, that's cool. I like that. Yeah. So what do you love about it? So I think the first thing that really drew me to it that I connected with as a kid growing up watching it was just kind of this strange hilarity of like things are a little out there, but they're not too far out in the fantasy world. They're close ish to life. Um, and it was interesting watching it last night, seeing kind of some of those elements like, man, no, there really is a lot of relationship in this. There's a lot to say about pain and the way that, as humans, we hurt, but when you have good relationship, relationship kind of drives everything and relationship can be this grounding force, but it's got to be something you invest in. That's an interesting take on it because <laughs> at the beginning, I think watching it for this go round, I thought maybe Buttercup and Wesley, it's an abusive relationship, but she's the abuser. <laughs> so I, I've definitely wondered like, mm, is this codependency is she taking advantage of is she manipulating and it was so funny last night watching it there were several points and I'm like man that's kind of a borderline behavior that she's doing there and I'd never had that thought before but I think that there are so many moments that like when I'm looking for the good and so much for me because I do a lot of trauma work I kind of stay in this place of like, look for the good, find that gratitude, mm -hmm. stay in that positive place because stories can come with so much weight um, that I definitely went into it watching for like, what are those good moments? Um, and I remember one really relevant point um, for me when they go into the fire swamp, you know, she just pushed him down the hill and then she realizes it's him. It's like, Oh no, what I do? And she jumps down the hill. She throws him. herself down right? the hill. <laughs> like, like not the healthiest thing, but there's also a level of like, Oh, sweet self-sacrifice. Like if this could be a healthy thing, it would not be like this. I might call it self-sacrifice if she'd have gone on the hill first. Well, you know, that I feel been like better. that's more like paying penance. I can see that too. Like I did this terrible <laughs> thing. I got to do it to myself too. I can see that too. I think for me watching it, it was like, oh no, like that's him. How do I get to him? And I've just pushed him down this hill. I've got to get there. How do I get there? Now this is also me watching it with a sick child at home Aww. at nearly midnight. So my brain was probably a little addled, but that's how I took it in the moment. How old's your kid? She just turned one. Wow. Okay. So you're not explaining things that are happening in the movie. No, to, no, okay. no. <laughs> that's what I was kind of wondering is there's some stuff that I feel like when we saw it as kids... And not even clinically, but revisiting it as adults, mm -hmm. you look at it and you go, oh, yeah, huh, that's messed up. That's, yeah. Um, and I think like looking back to the beginning of the movie, when you're like introduced to Wesley and Buttercup, one thing that struck me was, um, I guess, you know, maybe it was Peter Falk as the narrator. I can't remember who said it, mm -hmm. but somebody said they realized when 
he was saying, as you wish, he was saying, I love you. Right. And, you know, a movie is a slice of a story. Mm -hmm. The characters had something happening before. They have something happening after. I think watching it this time, I just kind of thought, is he in love with her? What does he love about her? Does he just think she's pretty? Mm -hmm. Is that really love? Because right. he just did these weirdly intense, long stares at her. Yep. And, you know, I just kind of thought, ah, is he lusting after her? Like, love. I mean, it's a children's movie, but right. it, it kind of made me want to go like, what are we telling people that love is? Mm -hmm. Because it seemed like he's just a guy that works at the family castle farm. or farm or whatever it is that her family owns. Yep. Um, and he's probably watched her for a long time. Yep. I think it was very much so infatuation. And like you said, kind of that lusting after part, it wasn't really an I love you. And it, it struck me how little you see them communicate. Mm hmm. Like there is no backstory other than as you wish, I love you. And suddenly she realizes, and then he's off to make his fortune so he can marry her. And it's like, this doesn't feel healthy, but okay, sure. Children's movie. We'll yeah. say it's love. Yeah. But right? I thought the same thing about the notebook. Oh, mm, we're not going into the notebook. <laughs> I am shocked. Nobody's <laughs> picked that yet for the show. Mm -mm. I had a big, I watched it for marital life cycle. I had a big oh, problem. Gosh. Yeah, so... With that. Yeah, I watched it, like, when it came out in theaters with my boyfriend at the time, which was, like, the worst relationship in my history of relationships. So there are a lot of bad feelings around that movie. I think that they had us watch it to demonstrate emotional tone. Like, if mm, you want it, that. things can, things can you know, come together. And, and, and for that, I'm like, all right, they both clearly wanted it. Yeah, so. they made it work. Yeah, they made it work. Which, I mean, I guess that would fit in with this one, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, although for a large part of this movie, one of them thought the other was dead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So tell me more about what it is that makes this your favorite. So I think one thing that has stuck with me all these years is Wesley's line. Um, after he'd saved Buttercup from the Sicilian and they're kind of having this argument on the top of the mountain and he's still got the mask on at this yep, point, right? He's still okay. got the mask on. She doesn't realize it's him yet. Um, and she's, she has figured out, Oh, you're the dread pirate Roberts. You killed my love. And she's kind of berating him and bashing him. And you can tell Wesley's really, really angry at her and super, super distant. And up to this point, you know, Wesley had come to rescue her. You see these moments of like, I care about this woman. I want her to be safe. I love her. I want to rescue her. Kind of an undertone of like, oh, this is a good thing. And then you see them together and it's very evident how royally pissed off he is at her. And he's, he's saying, yeah, you talk about faithfulness, you know, this unending faithfulness that Wesley told me about, but look at you. How long did you wait to get engaged to your fiance? Was it a week? Was it a month? And he's just so mad. And I forget what she says, but whatever she says prompts him to say, life is pain, Highness. Anyone who tells you differently is selling something. Mm -hmm. And that is something that... I watched this before my parents divorce, but I've watched it several times since. And that became kind of a theme. Like pain comes with life. Pain comes with living. It does not mean that it's the overarching thing, but it's a part of humanity. And it's not something that you've got to be afraid of or try to avoid. And I think to a certain degree, living your life in avoidance of it is cutting yourself off. Yeah. Because to be your authentic true self is to be vulnerable and to be vulnerable is to risk pain in relationship. Yeah. It's, it's always going to come with the possibility that there could be rejection. Absolutely. And Absolutely. And, um, I think for me, when I was doing some of my supervision time, one of the most powerful exercises that my supervisor um, 
taught was an experiential exercise. So you had to actually get up and do stuff. Um, and she had these pieces of paper on the floor and she had healing at one end of the room. And at the other end, she had abandonment and inadequacy. And she explained that as everybody has an original wound of some sort. And the majority of the time, it's going to go back to either abandonment and or inadequacy. So that's that thing that all of us has that can kind of inform and shape us in some way. Um, Whether it's I've been through something or I'm afraid of this, Mm -hmm. that's kind of that ultimate fear that if we delve down really deep, usually it becomes there. It's like, okay, sure, I'll get that. You know, that resonates with me personally. And she put out another piece of paper kind of close to healing. And it said pain. I was like, okay, where is this going? And then she laid out four other pieces of paper kind of in a box between pain and that back original wounding. And they said things like addiction and self-medicating, codependency, um, projection. And basically this example was... When we are working so hard to avoid this pain, we stand in these unhealthy places Mm -hmm. and we do these unhealthy coping skills because we're working so, so hard to avoid this pain, but we say we want healing. But in order to get to that place of healing, we've got to step into this pain box. Yeah. And we've got to let ourselves feel some things that we don't want to feel to recognize, hey, all of this avoidance, all of this unhealthy stuff, all of those addictions and those codependent relationships and those projections where you assume, oh, Josh thinks this about me, but the reality is I'm afraid of that in myself. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid that that's my thing. This isn't working. It takes a lot of energy to stay in this place just to try and avoid pain. Mm-hmm. Yes, that pain's going to hurt. No, we don't want to feel it. But ultimately, when we step into that place of pain, we can connect with a part of ourselves that says, Oh, all of that avoiding, all of those unhealthy coping skills. Yes, they served me for a time, but they're not working right now. And I don't want to continue to live in that place. I want to get to that place of healing. And I recognize I've got to change some things in my life. Yes. So engaging with the pain is the vehicle by which healing arrives. Right. Um, What do you say to the person that says time heals all wounds? Uh, I just need you know, we just got to give it time sometimes. Yeah. But I also think that when we're looking at wounds, especially deep wounds, I think of that physical analogy. If you've got a really big, deep cut, yes, time's going to heal that. Now, just like a really big, deep cut, if you don't treat it, if you don't do anything with it, it's going to scab over. It's going to be exposed to germs Maybe you get a pass and there's no infection and it just heals, but maybe some little invisible germ lands on it and it festers and it makes things worse. But ultimately at the end of the day, once it's healed, you still have a scar Mm -hmm. and anybody who's got a big scar knows that there are times it'll be fine. And then suddenly somebody happens to bump you in just the right way. And man, that scar fire Scar fire. Scar tissue lights <laughs> up like fire. That was my AIM chat name in uh, high school, Scar Fire. It wasn't. That, <laughs> that'd be amazing that'd be if it were. You got to add some, <laughs> some numbers on the end, though. Yes, of course, because otherwise it doesn't work because yeah. everybody else has chosen the best name first. Mm-hmm. Um, I always kind of think of... So I, I think there's this weird um, paradox when it comes to looking at time as a healer. Mm-hmm. Because you have some people that say... I just need time with enough time. Time heals all wounds. But then you have other people that will try to put limits on time yeah. uh, in a really shaming way. Mm-hmm. And, and and the first thing that comes to mind was there was this movie that Zach Galifianakis was in a long time ago that a buddy of my, and I used to watch called Out Cold, where it was like a comedy that was at a ski resort and somebody's going to buy the ski resort and we got to save it and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> but at the very beginning, you're introduced to the main character and he's clearly just gone through a breakup and this other girl that works there really likes him and she's trying to go on a date with him and she says, oh, well, you just go by the formula for every month you were together. Yeah. You get either a day or a week of grieving and then you just, you just move on. And so you have some people going, 
the more time, the more healed. And some people go, oh, no, you got to limit yourself. And I think in either way, it's just this, it's not so much that it's healing it so much as mm -hmm. it's allowing you to disengage from right. it. Right. Especially the one where just the more time. And then I think to like, uh, you know, attachment. And when you get that attachment wound, which only can come from people who really, really matter. Yeah. And who you really care about and the stakes are, are, are higher with that it's almost like it hits a pause button on the relationship. And though, yep. though time may pass until you go backwards and address that wound, yep. then the relationship can't grow because, you know, with, with attaching, uh, primarily and, uh, heavily to another person you're looking for, can I trust you to comfort mm -hmm. me when I'm in need? Um, are you going to be my anchor, my safe harbor for me to go out into the yeah. world and know that I can come back here? And when something has happened that's damaged that that trust, that's a giant deal. And time is not what's going to, mm -mm. especially if the other person is pretending like nothing happened. Right. Right. And I see, I see that difficulty with time a lot with, uh, my trauma clients, and I actually had a conversation just last week with one of my girls. Um, you know, she was kind of in this place of, oh, I should be better by now. You know, it's been this long since. And I had to remind her, yeah, it may have been this long since the event, but when did you actually start doing the work? Yeah. You, you know, you can't count all of those years since the event because... That's when you hit play. You right. You've been on pause. Right. And then you hit play when the work started. Exactly. So in reality, yes, you've had that much chronological time, but treatment time, you've only been working at this for two, three months. You're doing great, babe. Yeah. Like you're in a great place. You're supposed to feel a lot of messy feelings. You're not supposed to have it all together yet because you're just now doing the work. Mm -hmm. You needed that chronological time to get you to a place maybe where you were ready to step into it. You were ready to press play, but don't shame yourself and say, oh, I should be better. I should be healed from this yet. Because you are just now stepping into this. You're just now doing the work. And it's one of those things too, I think, people have a tendency to shame themselves for unhealthy ways of coping that have helped them survive. But when you're talking trauma, my God, how much did you have to do just to survive? And, and I'm not talking just the event. I'm talking the years and months afterwards. And you're still here. Right. So it worked. Exactly. It may, it may not be something that works anymore exactly. or something that you find useful or desirable but mm -hmm. i mean thank god for it it got you here exactly and that's where it, it no it's not the healthiest method okay maybe you need to grieve that maybe you need to feel angry at that self also recognize you were doing the best you had with every available resource you had at the time and it got you here mm -hmm. champion that part of it and if it's something you don't like then what can you do to change it? Let's mm -hmm. figure that out. I like the best you can thing. Mm -hmm. Because I think that, like even in the example that you were talking about, you've got a client who maybe is at a point of shaming themselves for taking so long to get here or whatever, but you were doing the best you can with what you had. And like I, I say to a lot of my clients, how would you have known how to... Mm -hmm how to effectively engage with these things when nobody taught you. Right. Like, how would you have known you? And, and it's really easy when, when some of them have kids, because you could say like, do you expect your little kid to do your family budget? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, do you, do you have expectations on them to do things that you know as an adult and they're a kid or beyond them? Of course you don't. Mm -hmm. You recognize where they are developmentally and what's appropriate for them. And in the same way, though you may have a bigger body, Mm-hmm. Maybe your emotional development did not uh, happen. It didn't. You didn't achieve that uh, where it would have been. Um, I don't know, desired, but right. that's okay. Absolutely, because you're tackling it now, and you're tackling it because you want to tackle it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I love. I'm as stressful sometimes as it was working in the hospital, one of the biggest things that that gave me was this wide view of there is no limit to mm -hmm. how old you can be when you make the decision that you want to change things. And you can absolutely change things at any point in your life. Um, one of my clients was talking to me about, oh, you know, 
I've been doing this for so long, you know, how can I ever get there? And I'm like, honey, look, I've worked with an 87 year old woman who was dealing with her trauma story that at that point was 50 years old and she was making astounding progress. You don't have a cap to this. You absolutely get to choose when you step into that work, how much you step into it, and you get to pace this. Yeah, and I think also typically when somebody feels like the the task is insurmountable, it's because they're trying to look at the whole thing at once. Yep. And that's when like my my recovery brain kicks in and I just go, all you got to do is just 24 hours at a time. Mm-hmm. You don't have to figure out what am I going to do with this big trauma mm-hmm. five years from now. Nope. All you got to do is what what can I do today? What What's the next right thing I can do today? And if 24 hours is too much, then you take it one hour at a time. Yep. And if one hour is too much, you take it mm-hmm. a half hour yep. or a minute or whatever you need. And that's going back to the film. That's why I love the way that Wesley and Buttercup go through the fire swamp. Because this is that thing as they're entering into it, Buttercup's so freaked out about, oh my gosh, we're going to the fire swamp. And I think Wesley makes a comment about how, oh, you just think that we can't do it because nobody's ever survived. Yeah, I thought, yeah, you think you can't do it because nobody ever has. Right? But then they walk into it and it's like totally nonchalant. Hey, whatever. We're just catching up and we're talking about these life things and we're doing relationship together. And oh, there's quicksand. And oh, there's this rodent of unusual size that suddenly attacks you. And mm-hmm. oh, there are the flame spurts. And it's no big deal. And he even talks about like signals mm-hmm. for those things. Yes. How there's like a plop mm-hmm. when the fire's about to come or something and how you can manage. Right. And I love it because I think so much of the time people can have this idea of this insurmountable, overwhelming task. But when you slow it down... And when you've got support, even even in the dynamic between Wesley and Buttercup, which we could debate all day long whether or not it's healthy or abusive or not or what, you know, you have that support and you know that that support's there and it makes it easier to walk through because mm-hmm. yeah. there's a little bit of place of, hey, I know I'm not doing this alone. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think as the movie progresses, they actually build that support system out. They build yeah. more of it. With Inigo and, uh, oh no, I forgot Andre the Giant's name. Fezzik. Fezzik. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I love their interplay too, Inigo and Fezzik. Uh-huh. Oh my Every gosh. time I see him, I think of um, Jason Segal in, I think it's I Love You, Man, when he's talking to Paul Rudd. And he does the, <laughs> yes. anybody want a peanut? <laughs> like he does that one. <laughs> yes. Ugh. Yeah, I, I think... One thing that I always really thought was funny about this movie is even when the characters are in antagonistic relationships, they're so polite. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Like Inigo is helping Wesley get up the (laughs) cliffside and then is like giving him a chance to take a breath and like take a break. And like Fezzik is proposing like, hey, let's just drop our weapons and like try this and... Let's do an honorable fight. Yeah, yeah. Well, and even too, like I love when Wesley defeats both of them. Like he, I'm trying to think, in ego at the end of the sword fight, he's like, just go ahead and kill me quickly. And he makes the comment of, I could no longer kill you than I could destroy a stained glass window. Like mm-hmm. you're this great swordsman and there's this honor and appreciation of the craft and who he is. And it's like, I mean, I got to knock you out, but yeah. I'm not going to kill you. Whereas if this was Game of Thrones, he would have oh. done all kinds of... Yeah, would yeah. have been a whole other world. What was uh, what was the uh, inconceivable guy's name? I am Vicini. terrible at character names. Vicini. No, I had to. Uh, okay, as many times as I've seen this movie, I had to look them up last night mm-hmm. to be like, it's not the Sicilian, it's not An- mm-hmm. Andre the Giant. What are their names? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I think this time I was struck by like I knew that he was kind of a weird little funny mm-hmm. whatever, but this time I was struck by it seems like Fezzik and. And Nigo are on a different page than him the whole time. Oh, yeah. Like, he is like, I'm doing this terrible thing. I am going to kill her. Mm-hmm. It's a fa- I'm going to kill her. You guys don't have to worry about it. I'm going to kill her. And he's like saying just terrible things towards them. And he's they're just horrible. kind of being polite. And it's a job. So yep. they're doing their job. Yep. Um, And so when, you know, Wesley, you know, happens upon them and does the Iocane powder and the, the wine thing. I don't 
don't know. I, I, and of course he, he dies and you find out later that Humper didn't get hired him. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think I was just struck by Wesley never becomes antagonistic towards him. Mm -mm. I think he knows this guy is set against me. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that there, to a certain degree, and this might be reaching, I don't know, but you know, hey, we're extrapolating principles of mental health and relationships from a movie. Right. It just, it, it struck me as an example of boundaries. Like mm. you, you, the only thing you have control over in your life is from your outer layer of skin in. Yep. Everything else you have no control over. And that includes you have control over how you respond to people. Mm -hmm. And I think it would have been really easy at that point. And clearly since he had demonstrated his skill with a sword, with an ego, even though Vincini has a dagger held up to Buttercup's uh, throat, he could have probably... More than likely. Like at one point in his fight with Inigo, he threw the sword a distance and it landed. Yeah, so he probably could have thrown the sword or something. Yes. Like you've seen, he's got the skill. He could yeah. take him out. But he chose how to engage him. Mm -hmm. Clearly, he was saying stuff. And really the guy, you know, hey, the guy has a punchable face. So yes. like even just the way that his voice tone and his... You know, all of that stuff could have probably made him angry enough to want to jump. But he, like, controlled himself. He mm -hmm. chose to engage. He mm -hmm. even, in choosing how to do the battle of wits, that's an example of a boundary, too. Like, yes. hey, if you want to be in relationship with me, this, these are the grounds by which you can be in that relationship. Exactly. This is how we're going to do it. Yeah. Here you go. Mm -hmm. And he's, I love it because he's not, you know discombobulated about he's not in his emotions about it he's just very matter of fact all right this is what what i'm reading from you this is what i'm gonna choose mm -hmm. now what are you gonna do yeah and he sits back and just kind of waits yeah it's he also do you do you engage with the enneagram at all so i'm just now getting into that okay a little bit it's yeah. very fun but i'm very new yeah I, I only know enough to be dangerous so like i'm in no <laughs> way and, and just because of my, you know, in getting the degree and going through a class on assessments and testing and stuff, I'm not into the whole, I'm going to let the result of one assessment define me. No. Nah. It just gives you more information. But like, if I had to guess, I would say that Wes was probably a six, uh, mainly because of how prepared he always was. Mm -hmm. Like starting out with his left hand in the sword fight, building up an immunity, Iocane powder, right. and then happening to have had some of that on him and using it. And like, in, it's very Batman. Like in all of these so ways, true. he had just like set up all of these things um, to help himself feel secure and safe. Mm -hmm. Even the whole uh, identity is the Dread Pirate Roberts. Yes. Um, helping him feel safe while he was trying to, I guess, build up his wealth to come back to Buttercup. That's what we assume from the storyline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell me more about the movie. You watched it through a different lens. I'm just so curious because totally that, that's what happened to me <laughs> with like Eternal Sunshine. Like I loved it for so long. I went back and watched it through a different lens. And So one thing that I noticed um, that was really curious to me was the way that Humperdinck presents. Um, he's very, very evidently all about control and power. And I don't know why. Maybe it was the you know, time of the night in the sick kid again, but it struck me as really funny how Buttercup references him being known as this great tracker, right? It's like this is something he's so skilled at. And as you see the story unfold, well, of course he's a good tracker. He hired a dude to steal his fiance to kill her. So he knows exactly where they're going to be. Mm -hmm. And it just feeds into that that dynamic where he is so, so attached to that need to be seen in a certain light and to be powerful and to be in control of so many things. And it, it just, it made me think of, you know, an abuser in, in a really mm. traumatic relationship. Like they are so attached to that, that they're so invested in the way that they're seen. They're so invested in having that control that, you know, you question, okay, how much of this are you making a very conscious choice? You're, you're hiring somebody to f steal your fiance and how much of it are you like, oh, but I'm the king. This is how I'm supposed to be. And you're kind of doing this at a subconscious level. That strikes me as an image thing too. Mm -hmm. I need yeah. to be seen in this way. This, this is who, 
if not, this is who I am. This is who I'm supposed to be. Right. And I've got to do what I can to maintain that because without that, who am I? Right. And it was interesting too. I remember having the thought after the wedding happened when his parents were walking Buttercup up to the honeymoon suite and you, you see, I think you see them, the parents maybe three times throughout the film. By the way, every viewing of this that I've ever had never realized that that was the prince's parents. Are up you Up until serious? this one. Yeah. They're, like you said, they just bleed into the background so much. <laughs> like, I so mean. I don't know. For me, like, I always just assumed that's who they were. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just kind of thought it was uh, Prince in the same way that in the Disney Robin Hood, Prince John was really the ruler. Yeah, that Like, I just kind of assumed he's the one that's in the spotlight. He's the one that is the main, you know, Dude, person so ever. And it, it, this was the first time that I was like, hey, look at those two people. That must be the, <laughs> that's probably his parents. They're his parents. King and queen. Yeah. Yeah. But it was interesting to me because you see this dynamic of like totally detached mother, father who's kind of addled and not with it. And it made me wonder when you're looking at Humperdinck's need for that power and control like what was his dynamic with them growing up what happened oh i bet they were like the most hands off right and just let him kind of roll with whatever like yeah. it's just so interesting to me like there's almost a part of me that wishes they would do another film to look at like what's the background story of all of these people and how did they get to this don't point? put it out into the world you know that oh but like, i would love it yeah but, but I I, we don't it. we don't need like a 30 <laughs> year after like reboot of the princess see, bride. No, not a reboot, not a reboot. But if we go back and get their backstory to me, that's a different thing. Plus now buttercup is uh what's her name? Uh, Underwood on house of cards. So yeah, like Claire, we don't, we don't need, we don't need those. We just need a whole new cast. And this Wesley is lost his foot in the saw movies. <laughs> <laughs> all the things that yeah. happened. Although he was in Robin Hood Men in Tights, so which was super fun. Oh, that's one of my favorite. Love that kid. movie. Oh yeah, <laughs> that and Spaceballs. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, I haven't seen that in forever. It's great. Um. Yeah, it seems like I mean, I don't know. I I don't want to like put put on the parents that you did something wrong. And your kid turned out this way because I think that there's times where parents can do everything right. And mm -hmm. a kid is still a person right. and they still get to choose to a right. certain degree, like, you know, who it is that they become. But certainly he ruled the roost. Mm -hmm. uh, now he mm -hmm. ruled the roost. Yeah. And though he was just a prince and they were the king and queen, they weren't stepping in and intervening mm -mm. in anything that they were seeing. Yeah. It was so bizarre. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to me, you know, that made made me think of um, Buttercup's like suicidal comments and how nobody, nobody really did anything with those. Hmm. You know, when she came in, she gave that ultimatum of either you, I don't remember if she was like, either you find Wesley or you bring him back or whatever. Or when I'm was this? Kill I'm like blanking. So on this. I'm trying to think she'd had a nightmare that they had gotten married and she was being presented as the queen. And there was that like old lady yelling at her in the dream. And then she wakes up. Mm -hmm. The grandson is like, wait, wait, you know, that can't be true. Real. He, you know, she marries Wesley, you know, Humperdinck, you know, has to go who kills Humperdinck kind of thing. And you, you realize, Oh no, this was a dream sequence. Oh yeah. And was she he rushes already, in. was he already in the pit? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and so after she wakes up from the stream, she rushes into Humperdinck and makes that demand of like, find him or, you know, bring him back or whatever it is, or I'm going to kill myself. And Humperdinck is just like, not faced. It's like, oh, sweetheart, I wouldn't want that to happen. Of course, I'll, um, I'll send my four fastest ships, mm -hmm. which you later find out he doesn't do. And then after they actually go through the wedding ceremony and she's walking upstairs with the parents, she you know, stops dad and says, I'm going to kill myself, you know, gives him a kiss on the cheek. Thank you so much for this. I'm going to kill myself. And dad in his adult state, like, I don't know if he just completely misses it or if that's like part of the character development that dad's just not supposed to acknowledge it. You know, mom had already walked off in the shot and he goes, Oh, she kissed me, you know? And it's <laughs> like, that is not the thing that we need to be paying attention to. Yeah. Here. 
not very attuned. No. Huh. This maybe they just thought, and 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 really, if you look at her character through most of the movie, maybe they just thought, ah, she's being histrionic, like she's just. Mm-hmm. So maybe you know they heard her, right. they just didn't believe her, right? And that's kind of one of those things that makes you question, like, okay, well, what is the backstory here? Mm-hmm. Going back to, I think for me, like when you see Buttercup and Wesley at the beginning, like, how did this really happen? Like, what is this dynamic really? Do you understand what love is? Or is this more of an infatuation kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. And what's the, what's the payoff? So if it is an infatuation, what's the, what are you getting from it to keep up the behavior? Right. Um, or is it just, which I don't know. I mean, it's not like infatuation is all the way bad because Mm -hmm. I'm sure that there's a lot of relationships that have started that way, but they got to keep progressing. They, they got to not just stop at the infatuate like at some point you got to engage right you've got to grow into something in order for it to last and be a real healthy thing Mm -hmm. rather than just gosh she's pretty right and having the heart eyes Mm -hmm. towards her Mm -hmm. um i love you you mentioned the grandpa i love peter falk so much Mm. um (laughs) keep your shirt on (laughs) He's so great. All right, all right. Shut up. <laughs> He's so great. And I love that the story is set in that context. And like the way that they did it, you kind of forget that this is like based out of a grandpa who loves his grandson who's sick. And like he's showing up to take care of and connect with his grandson. Yeah. Yeah. I got babysat by having the prices right turn on when I was sick. Yeah. Columbo never came into my room and read me a story. No. It would have been nice. It would have been nice. Yeah. Um, I he, I think what was interesting that he did, uh, one thing, was that at the beginning, Fred Savage is like articulating, listen, this is the kind of story I want. <laughs> yeah. I want like fights and I want, you know, this kind of thing and all that. And then, of course, you get to like the kissy parts and he's mm-hmm. like, ew, gross. <laughs> He keeps going with the story and at certain points he like stops almost to draw out his uh, longings, his Mm -hmm. desires, his like wanting to engage in the drama, in the story, in the relationship. And, you know, that's kind of an interesting contrast to like Humperdinck and his parents that we can draw is Mm -hmm. letting the kid develop the want yeah, rather than just here's everything. Mm -hmm. You know, because that want can be a good drive. Right. And I think, too, being attuned to, you know, my kid is sick and there is a level of what's appropriate and, like, let's not get him too riled up. I remember um, my husband was watching part of it with me and he had been texting his mom and um, it was the scene where they were on the boat. They had just stolen, kidnapped, not stolen, (laughs) Well, kind of similar. Kind of the same thing. Kind of, yeah, kind of similar. But um, they had grabbed Buttercup and they were on the boat and they were, you know, fleeing to the cliffs of insanity. And um, she jumped overboard and she was in the water with the eels. And the shrieking eels. Yes. I noticed that my husband had stopped texting his mother and was like really raftly paying attention. Huh. And then I know that this break is going to come where the grandfather's like, Hey, like it's gonna be okay, and so I'm kind of like watching for this and kind of watching he not my seen husband. It before? He'd seen it. It's just been oh, okay. a long time. Yeah, he's yeah, not yeah. as big a fan as I am, so it had been a lot longer for him. But he's like just engrossed at this point. So I'm kind of watching for the break, and I'm kind of watching him out of the side of my eye. And when that break happens, and Grandpa says, "Hey, it's gonna be okay. She doesn't get killed." I just noticed my husband relax this tiniest bit. And I'm like, you've seen this, you know, it's going to be okay. But it just really highlighted for me, like those moments where we need somebody else to give us that reassurance and to be attuned with us enough to recognize like, Hey, I see you're afraid of this. And I just want to let you know, it's going to be okay. Like we don't, we don't have to freak out about this. I'm still in this with you. And it was just such a funny little moment for Mm -hmm. me to watch this grown man have that moment watching this, you know, grandfather, grandson dynamic in the yeah. midst of this crazy, ridiculous story. You know, what's interesting about that. I, I mean, you tell me if you experienced this or not, but there's, there's certain 
I mean, like movies, certain stories that we connect with and matter so much to us that when we share it with somebody who matters to us, it's almost like we're more interested in watching them experience it. Yes. Because we want it to matter to them too. Yes. And I think vice versa too, because listening to you talk about that, the thing that comes to my mind is how much my granddad loves um, A Christmas Story. And every year, like it's a good enough movie. For me personally though, the thing that I get most out of it is watching him watch it. Mm -hmm. Because he loves it so much. Like, I mean, we've got a real life size leg lamp at their house. Nice. They have leg lamp <laughs> ornaments. Like it, it's just hilarious. But I think there's so much that's true with that. Like we love that connection and we love that mm -hmm. sharing the things we love with other people that we love. Yeah. It's a way of giving part of ourselves to them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I wish there's too many of them for us though. Cause there's so many times where I'll put something on and I'm like, Leah, <laughs> and like, she'll be in the middle of doing something important. I'm like, you need to watch this cat video on YouTube because I love it. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Yep. And There's like response. no discernment. It's either the most important thing or it's not important. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately there's too many important things but you know that's okay because there's ruin relationships to grow and like talk yeah. about that <laughs> yeah yeah there's been many confrontations where she's been like no i cannot watch this clip of Shit's creek season one bloopers mm -hmm. right now i need to do this other thing <laughs> yep um, we've had those in our house too <laughs> but but there's been so many so many times where and then there's also times where you have this like almost corrective emotional experience or a bonding moment shared over mm -hmm. uh, a, a shared experience engaging with something. Yeah. Um, like a certain movie that you went to on a date or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a movie uh, sticks out in your mind because you were in the middle of a conflict and you watched it and afterwards you realized, oh, you know what, this is silly, I shouldn't, you know. Um, it's really, you know, to have elements of story that become, I don't know, mile markers mm -hmm. in your relationship. Yeah. It's a cool thing. It is. And I think too, sometimes when we have relationships that fall apart and we've shared those things that we love, there's almost this reclaiming that has to happen, right? There was this article in Entertainment Weekly a while ago that talked about losing. It was doing it in reference to music. Mm -hmm. Losing your favorite music oh. to a relationship. And what do you do? Can you get that back? So I mean, for me personally, I think absolutely yes. And professionally too, because I have conversations with my clients sometimes. It's, it's going and it's reclaiming those things that really are yours, that you really connect with and you care about and that you love, but maybe because of this experience you've been through, whether it's a trauma or a breakup or whatever, that you've got to reclaim that as yours. Do you think that if, if going towards that movie or music or whatnot is, is too painful, do you think that's evidence that there's still work to be done? I think sometimes, I don't think it's that clear cut Okay. because I think sometimes it's just evidence that it mattered, that it yeah. had an impact, you yeah. know? I think sometimes, yes, especially if you look at something and it's a super disproportionate response, mm -hmm. maybe that's a place where it's kind of that, hey, you need some more work here. But if it's one of those that you can look at that and there's that twinge of sadness or there's that twinge of hurt, that may just be an indicator, I think, to say, hey, that mattered and that made an impact on your life. And you feel it and you acknowledge it and you get to move on. Yeah. And I think that the feeling and the acknowledging, it's not like that even just happens once. Mm -mm. Sometimes, you know, something that mattered, it's not like we're going to get reminded of it one other time. Right. And part of the, you know, grief isn't necessarily a one-time event. Mm -mm. And so part of dealing with our sadness and our grief is just whenever it comes up, hey, there you are. Yep. And acknowledging it and, and tending to it and mm -hmm. and realizing that it's it pops into visit every now and then mm -hmm. and then it leaves. Right. 
and I keep moving. Right. And just because you're feeling it again doesn't mean you haven't done the work and you haven't made the progress. Yeah. Yeah. And I think especially the more personal work you do, the the bigger your capacity to love and to mm-hmm. care about things. And, and inevitably that means that they're going to matter more. You're mm-hmm. going to engage with them more. So that, and that's just the vulnerability we were talking about before. Yeah. Like you, you have to risk hurt mm-hmm. in order to be in relationship. Yeah. It's inevitable. Mm-hmm. And it's okay. It doesn't mean that because you hurt, because you're sad, that that's a bad relationship. Mm-hmm. It may mean that, oh, okay, there's something in my story that's coming into play here that I've got some more healing to do in this aspect. Um, I like analogies a lot. Mm-hmm. So with this one, I use an analogy of climbing up a mountain. And very rarely, if you've got a steep mountain, is the path straight up. More frequently, is it a winding path or a path that circles? Mm -hmm. And because of that, you progress further and further up the mountain, but you get to see the same tree a few different times. But when you see that tree, you see it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it doesn't mean that you haven't done the work. You've addressed that bottom part of the tree that you saw when you passed it the first time. Now you're passing it the fourth time and you're at the top of that tree. Also, interestingly, that's also a marker of progress. Exactly. So that tree is kind of important. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think so often we forget about that. Yeah. We're so upset about, man, this tree's back again. What did, what did I do to make this tree show up again? Why can't I get over this tree? Why can't I get past it? That's the beauty of therapy, though, is because sometimes if we're in it ourselves, we can't see it. Mm-hmm. It's tough to read the label when you're inside the bottle. Yep. And so to have a, another observer, you know, because you're encountering that tree and you're just like, oh, frick. <laughs> yep. And then to have somebody else say, yeah, but you're not looking at it from the ground level anymore. You're not mm-hmm. looking at it from the same perspective. You've actually mm-hmm. gained this much. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Wow. I didn't realize that. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else from Princess Bride? Man, um, not therapeutically. Not therapeutically? I'll say this. I, I, Watching it again, saw a lot of just really funny funny things uh-huh. um they were just kind of like huh, well, really really that that happens um like in the fight scene between Inigo and um Wesley Wesley thank you I was like Carrie but that's not his character name um mm-hmm. you see them go over the bars and land and you can very se- clearly see the pop of the mat beneath yeah, them it's, as the dust. Pad, yeah. it's like man <laughs> all right that's there mm-hmm. I like that they didn't know that out that that's really clearly what that is. That's not hard ground. Um, I like how there's absolutely no transition in the middle of the fire swamp between Wesley and Buttercup having this dialogue about things. And she's like, huh? And just kind of placid face turns around and immediately steps into quicksand. I'm like, wait, what? what? Mm-hmm. And it's just so many strange little funny things that I love. Yeah. Fa- favorite line from the movie. Still has to go back to life is pain, highness. Yeah. Huh. Anyone who tells you differently is selling something. Um, do you have a favorite character? Ooh. <laughs> so my mind automatically goes to the albino that tends to Wesley in the pit. <laughs> He's just <laughs> such a strange little oddball character. I think one of the funniest <laughs> parts of the whole movie is when he starts speaking in the weird, like, goblin voice <laughs> yes. and then clears his throat and he just has a normal Yes, and he's got voice. such a minor role, but I just love him so much. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you've got to love the priest. Oh, With yeah. Horrible, I thought it, I, I, I almost stopped you earlier when you started talking about the marriage part. You didn't say marriage, like, no. which I feel like you have to. <laughs> In fact, the guy, my mentor that married Leanne and I, he's a big fan of the movie. I'm honestly surprised he didn't work that into oh. his. <laughs> he so should have. His thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That I was expecting great. that. I was expecting some Seinfeld references and. None of it. He happened. treated it with he treated it with care and Aww. honor. Yeah. <laughs> Look at him go. Um, so tell me something that your clients have taught you. I think one of the biggest things my t- clients have taught me is the power of silence um, and not trying to rush. They've um, taught you that? Yeah. Wow. Um, 
I think Are mostly, you getting shushed in your, se- in your sessions? No, I, it goes back to, I think I'm a very, very direct therapist. Mm-hmm. And so I'm pretty ready to speak into things. And there have been, I think because of that, clients who have responded really, really directly to me. And so sometimes if I step into things and I'm rushing the process and not realizing it, they have gotten comfortable enough with me or maybe they're direct enough just in their personalities to say like, hey, I'm not ready to go there yet. Mm -hmm. And kind of highlight for me like there are times that that I need to just be quiet and let them do the work and let this happen. It could be a pacing thing Mm -hmm. too. Like just because we're ready doesn't mean that they are. Right. And so I think having some of those experiences um, really brought an awareness of that for me. Um, And it's something that I try to be much more mindful of in session to really gauge, okay, are you ready to go there? Um, And at times some of that may be me actually asking like, hey, I'm noticing this. Is that something you're ready to step into? But at times it may be just making the read of, yeah, I see this and I see your resistance to it. So I'm not even going to bring it up. Um, and I think another thing for me that has been a really big thing to learn, um, is the power of speaking really clearly into, um, people's pain and into people's feelings and being able to really voice that for them. Um, especially when they have a history of having difficulty kind of calling it for what it is. Sometimes I think being that like mirror, giving them words, giving them words, giving them that mirror to say like, Hey, I see, I see this. And to me, this feels like shame. Is that resonating with you? And, and they kind of have that light bulb moment of like, Oh, that's what that's called. That's what this is. And you see those floodgates open of like, man, I didn't realize and here everything is. And suddenly it's this breadth of work that can be done mm-hmm. because they've had that realization. And I think for me, being trained in this, having done this for as long as I have, sometimes I forget that people don't have that language and people don't know those things. And so something that for me is very second nature, I don't even realize, Hey, I need to slow down and explain what that is. Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of teach and give you some language and give you some tools in that regard. Um, and so that's a good reminder for me as well. I think that's such an interesting thing that, that there are times where language can unlock, um, can unlock an experience Mm -hmm. and give meaning to it Mm -hmm. when we don't have the words to comprehend or understand something just by being given Mm -hmm. a few words, all of a sudden we're able to conceptualize it and integrate it in a way that we weren't before. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's amazing. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, let's say that somebody was listening to our conversation today and they think, oh man, I could just really connect with her. I'd love to see her as a client. How can they get a hold of you? Easiest way is probably going to be to shoot me an email. Mm-hmm. Jesse at is healing dot space. Um, dot space. Dot space. Okay. So yeah, when I was looking at uh, domain names, all of the dot com and dot orgs were taken and like, Okay, so what else is there? Because the only other thing I've heard of is like .net, and I don't like that. .gov, .org. And so... There's a .farm now. What? Yeah. There's a .theater. That's amazing. Yeah. So I didn't see any of those. What I saw was .space, and Mm -hmm. I was like, if my business name is Inner Strength Healing, shortened to Is Healing... Like I'm creating a space for healing to happen. Okay. So let's run with that. Let's play with that. That sounds really fun and I like it. So is healing. I thought maybe you're going for like a cosmic decor in the office or something. Though I do love a lot of galaxy prints with blues and purples and pinks. Oh, (laughs) all right. All right. Yeah. So email. Email. Um, Is there anything else going on that you, uh, you want to let people know about? Um, yeah, so I am, because of my history as a group therapist, um, I've really realized that I actually love that. Um, and it's something that I've missed, uh, transitioning to private practice. So I'm going to be starting a few different groups in January. Um, one is going to be a women's group, just all about women's resilience and, um, kind of getting out of this cattiness that we can sometimes fall into as women as though we've got to compete against one another and really coming into a space of 
honoring like these are our strengths these are the things that I've overcome and how can I celebrate my successes and yours Hmm. and how do we really create that community that's a really healthy thing um another one is a little bit of a vulnerable step and a challenging step for me because I've been so immersed in working with women for so long um I am actually wanting to start a men's group and do like a men's emotional intelligence group Um, one of the things that I saw when I was working with male clients was that tendency to default to either an anger or an anxiety place and not really resonate or allow themselves to connect with a whole lot of other emotions Um, And so I think that there may be a space to just come together with other like-minded guys. And I recognize I'm a female saying this and that feels a little weird to me, but come into a place with a lot of like-minded guys and be like, look, I recognize that the way that I've done emotions in the past isn't working for me. And how do I find that new way? I think that, I think you being a one, a, my group therapy was led by a woman. Mm -hmm. Um, but B, I think that that could be a very, very useful thing because you will be able to demonstrate emotion through healthy intimacy in the group. That's my hope. And I mean, a lot of, you know, what you described, a guy defaulting to, uh, anger or anxiety, I think, um, fear and shame are big with mm-hmm. with guys as well so to be able to not just help them engage with those things and process them but then to model them in an opposite sex therapeutic relationship mm-hmm. i think will be really helpful that's the hope yeah so like i said a little bit of vulnerable place a little bit of a challenging place sure. for me but i'm really excited about it and then the last one mm-hmm. go ahead i was just going to say so i'm imagining it'd be helpful if these were middle tennessee people to yes. come in for these yes so at this at this current time, what I'm looking at doing are um, in-person groups only. I'm playing around with the possibility of doing some virtual groups um, statewide to open that up, but that's not something that I'm quite there yet. Um, I'm doing kind of a trial run with um, two offerings of a class this month in December, um, not this month, Um that are going to be on mindful intention practically though. Right. I mean, we're almost there. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to do one of those as a virtual group, um, class. And so that'll be my kind of first foray into like, okay, how does this actually work? Does my application do what I want it to do? Um, all of that. So that's going to be fun. And that's hopefully going to give me, um, some information to be able to step into virtual groups in the future. Um, but the third one that I'm offering in January kind of came from a place of, this weird realization that I was having a lot of both personal and professional conversations with people who had been hurt by the church and just Christianity at large and like struggling with faith and what does this mean to me? And these are my experiences and two Oh one, they would tell me and there's nowhere for me to talk about this or, you know, and you're the first person I've told about this because I'm not Mm -hmm. comfortable telling anybody else about that. And it, to me, I have my own personal faith story. I have my own faith background And so I'm not a minister. I am not a theologian, but I've been in that place of questioning. I've been in that place of doubt. And I feel like when I was in that place, I didn't feel like there was a place to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm having all of these suddenly random, seemingly out of left field conversations about this, that to me feels like something that's needed in this community. And if I'm not finding it, why am I not creating it? Yeah. Um, so that's something that I'm going to be rolling out as well. And so I'd imagine if somebody's local and they're interested in a group, email? Yep. Perfect. Same place. Nice. Thank you so much for coming on today. It has been an absolute pleasure. It has been so fun to do yeah. this. Can't wait to have you back. Thanks so much. Nice. Hey, hey, everybody. This is Josh back after the episode interview with Jesse Whitfield, counselor here in Nashville, Tennessee, on the Princess Bride. Uh, I guess I guess maybe I'll do this uh, a second week in a row just to remind everybody, typically this is the place in the episode where uh, my wife Leanne joins me in kind of recapping the interview, giving her thoughts on it, her thoughts on the movie. Um, two episodes ago, uh, Leanne let us know that she... Uh, was making a decision to 
step away from the podcast for right now. Of course, we know that whenever we say yes to one thing in our lives, we have to say no to something else to make room for that. And so for right now, she needs to say yes to some other things. And so she's she's stepping back from this. So uh, in the place of that, I'm going to be doing the wrap up on my own. And while, of course, as a podcast host, I am sad and will miss her presence on the show as a husband um, and the president of her fan club. I am just the biggest advocate and cheerleader for any decision that involves her caring for herself and getting what she needs. So um, this week's episode on The Princess Bride uh, was, I, I just thought, amazing. And, and typically, I think that about most episodes. Um, maybe that's a bias. I don't know. Um, but I grew up watching The Princess Bride, loved it, thought talking with Jesse was just incredible, and was particularly struck, I don't know about struck, but, but, but like impacted and, and um, inspired by, by two things that she was talking about. The first is the line of the movie that sticks out the most to her, where uh, Wesley says, you know, life is pain, anybody that says anything different is trying to sell you something. And I think it, you know, it, it reminds me of my therapeutic journey as a client myself and just how, and I've said it on the show before, I, I imagined at the beginning that A, therapy would be a lot like high school where you knew I'll be in therapy for this exact length of time, whatever that length of time was, and I'll graduate, and, and when I graduate... I thought therapy would be like a, I don't know, process that helped me become more stoic, that I would feel less feelings, like things wouldn't bother me or affect me, and I would travel through life in kind of a blissful, uh, zen-like state, um, namasteing, you know, <laughs> other people whenever I was... Uh, something was, uh, some offense was attempted against me. But what I've, what I found through my own therapeutic work as a client and what I find every single day uh, in my therapeutic work as a clinician is that um, you don't end up not feeling when you go through therapy. Instead, you, you feel more things you're more in touch with your feelings and you know more about what your feelings are trying to tell you and, and what to do with the information that it's telling you. And um, I know that as I was coming awake to that as a client, it, it was something that was puzzling. It was something that I really struggled with getting a hold of. Um, but through, you know, sessions with my own therapist, through practicing healthy intimacy with with people that I cared about and with cared about me um, I realized oh this is this is actually how how life is supposed to be and that line um, life is pain anybody else that uh, that tells you different is trying to sell you something Th there's a part of me that that thinks that that's a little pessimistic or, or nihilistic um, in that, I, I do think there is pain in life, but life is not all pain. Um, but I think that trying to avoid the pain, the pain that is present in life, um, ends up working against us. Because when we try to run away from one emotion, when we try to um, maybe even numb one emotion, we don't end up getting to just do that with one. We end up doing that with all. And so if we try to avoid one specific type of feeling, I don't want to feel sad. I don't want to feel hurt. I don't want to feel lonely, whatever it is. What ends up happening is we actually cripple our ability to feel any emotion. And because of that, we become less in tune with ourselves. And so while, yes, you know, life Life, life itself isn't pain. Pain is but one element of our experience of life. And I think if we don't engage in the uh, total spectrum of emotion, um, 
that life offers. Gladness, anger, hurt, fear, shame, sadness, loneliness, uh, guilt, then we are missing out on part of the experience. We're missing out on most of the experience of life. We were, we were designed to have all of these emotions, uh, to be as much of, of ourselves as we can be. Um, and the second thing that stuck out to me that Jesse talked about was her passion for and pursuit of providing group therapy. Um, group therapy was a big part of my journey. Um, I was with my individual therapist for two and a half years, and in the midst of that did six months of group therapy, and totally, completely different experience as a client uh, in group therapy uh, as it was in individual therapy. In group therapy, it's not, I mean, obviously, but it's not just you and the therapist in the room. It's you, the therapist, and more people, and one you know benefit of that is that you get to learn from other people's experience other people's process other people's life but two it acts as almost like a laboratory where let's say that you enter into group therapy to learn how to better process your emotions because you feel like you're locked up when you get into relationships and you want to be able to express your feelings better. So in the group therapy room, the therapist can actually help you learn to express those things with other members of the group. And what ends up happening is, you know, you can process things quicker because you're not just using the information that you provide. And you end up bonding with the members of your group. And so you end up forming you know, friendships uh, that involve healthy intimacy. And, and, and I'm just a big advocate for that. So um, absolutely thought that the, that the conversation I got to have with Jesse was incredible. I can't wait to have her back on. Um, today, we're releasing the episode. It's the, it's the first week of December, which means it's the last month of the decade. And I know I said that in the intro, but that, that's still kind of blowing my mind. So I'm already looking forward uh, to the year 2020. I'm already looking forward to season two of Therapist Theater, and I'm already starting to dream up what that may look like. Uh, can it look differently? Um, will there be different elements? So what I'd love to invite you to do is um, let me know what you like about the show. Let me know, you know what you think could be improved on. Let me know what you might change if you had the chance to change it. Let me know things that you think, hey, maybe this is a piece that I think is missing. I'd love for you to add it in. Um, let me know things that you really like. Uh, shoot me an email, therapisttheater at gmail.com, therapisttheater at gmail.com, or hit us up on uh, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. We're in those places too. Uh, YouTube as well. So looking forward to hearing from you. Um, I think we're going to call that a show right there. So we're going to go ahead and raise the lights, lower the curtain, and say that for this week, the theater is closed. 